Marvin, if there's any concept that has haunted me throughout my life is, is there anything more to reality than the physical world that we know? And in the last couple of decades, it's been fascinating because this concept of consciousness has been used by not only theologians, but atheistic philosophers who, although they don't believe in God, see in consciousness some indication that there is more to the world than the physical world. They come up with all sorts of theories, but at, but at heart, there's something more than the physical world. Well, the example of that that I find most striking is when one of these, I know the philosophers you're talking about, and they'll say, I can understand how a machine could do all the kinds of things a person can, but now, of course, they're lying. <laughs> uh, they're oversimplifying. They haven't the slightest idea how people do most of the things <laughs> they do. So uh, we already have to take them with a grain of salt. But they say, but I can understand how a machine could look at some object and say, that shirt is blue. And uh, what do they mean by blue? They mean that there's an immediate sensation of blueness, which is not physical. It's yes. hard to explain. What could a sensation be? And they say, the mystery is, how come this is so immediate and intense and realistic and so forth if it's just a bunch of complicated processes? Well, the answer is that every phrase of what I just said is wrong. There's nothing immediate <laughs> about seeing blue or red. Uh, there are uh, cells in the brain that are good for, that are, have evolved in the retina, that have evolved to be sensitive to red light. And then there are some eight levels of processing where you, uh, some part of the brain finds that there are some colored patches, that they're connected, there's a colored region, it has a certain shape, and that shape is part of some other thing. And sometimes if you see, uh, doesn't it look like this hand has fingers, yes. you can't see them. <laughs> it's almost as immediate to see the parts that you're imagining as the parts that are real. So when uh, those philosophers talk about how sensation and subjective experience is immediate, that's very funny. Because what it means is their model of how their mind works is so simple that it just divides into <laughs> uh, real and imaginary. And so uh, I don't have much respect for those philosophers because it's not immediate. In fact, if I take parts of the brain out, you don't see that. If I take other parts of the brain out, you say you see it when it isn't there. And <laughs> there are lots of things that can go wrong with that process. Well, what they talk about is the difference between a third-person analysis, I see blue because it's a certain wavelength and it hits the retina this way, and you do all the analysis. All that differentiated from what they say the first person experiences that this qualia, this sensation that that can't be communicated to anyone else. I don't know if the blue I see looks the same to the blue you see, even though we both call it blue, because that's this first person experience. And the fact that there is a first person experience means that consciousness is something special. Well, the first answer is that what you see as blue is not the same as what I see as blue because I have different mental processes. So they're making some kind of assumption that's, that's just plain silly. Another thing is the idea that I have privileged access, as some philosophers call, yes. call it, to my thoughts. And yet we all know that a certain person uh, has a friend. Uh, John has a friend, Mary. John can better predict how Mary will react to a certain situation than Mary can. <laughs> this isn't always the case, but it's frequently the case. And the philosopher Gil Gilbert Ryle, in his book The Concept of Mind, has a wonderful attack on this idea that a person has a special private access to their own mind. Mm. Well, each part of my brain does have better access to uh, some parts of my brain than to someone else's, but not much better. <laughs> and uh, I think it's just exaggerated. I do not have access to good descriptions of my 20 or 30 models of myself. Uh, I only think I have access, and uh, the part of my brain that talks doesn't know very much about what happens in the rest. So the idea that there's a central I who has the experience, yes. I think, is uh, a typical case of taking a common concept 
and not realizing that it has no good technical counterpoint, counterpart, uh, but it has 20 or 30 different meanings and you keep switching from one to the other without knowing it. So it all seems like one thing. So this one thing that it seems, this first person experience that we call consciousness, but it, it is this experience, this, this apparently immediate experience, assuming what you say, that it is really the, the sum of these 20, 30, however many different components in some different way, is that sufficient to undercut the argument that consciousness is a, a defeater of materialism, that the, the, there is something beyond the physical world? I think when we make machines that have these multiple levels of organization, we'll find that when, if the machine manages, if we manage to make it uh, have the same sort of structure that the human brain has, we don't know enough about that yet to do it, that it will report the same sorts of things. And when it says, I see blue, we'll be able to see all the processes that this involved. And we'll also see that it doesn't involve much understanding of what that process is, and so it seems very mysterious and unphysical. If you don't know how it works, like when Houdini or uh, <laughs> Penn and Teller make an elephant disappear, uh, <laughs> then you say, this is not physical, it's impossible. <laughs> when you know how the magic trick works, then the sense of wonder goes away, although you might still remember how it puzzled you once. <laughs> So the fundamental question, again, is when we analyze all these pieces of consciousness, is there anything left over that allows us to go beyond the physical world? Well, the physical world is everything we know. <laughs> and uh, if somebody believes that there's another world that's, uh, that we can't see or measure, uh, they're entitled to their opinion. But I think uh, the more you develop that idea, the more cubic centimeters of your brain you're wasting uh, <laughs> with uh, questions that uh, don't make any sense and can't be answered. If there's, if there's another universe somewhere that doesn't interact with this one, uh, then it's not physical and it's silly to worry about it. However, if there's another universe with a thinking machine and it's, it has invisible wires connected to your brain <laughs> that change how you behave, <laughs> then we want to build new instruments to find it. Well, the, the argument says that, the, that, that consciousness is, is so unique because of this first person experience that it cannot be explained no matter how you, you look at the brain in terms of its neuronal le level or the systems level, or however you want to explain it. There's always going to be something left over and that which is left over is this first person experience. Well, I think the first person experience comes when uh, maybe you're three or four months old or six months or nine months, whatever it is, when you notice that there are other people who do some of the same things you do, but <coughs> I can move my hand and I can't move your hand. <laughs> and at some point the baby recognizes there's a big difference and it makes a concept of the self, which is my body and a little later my mind. And that's, the, uh, that's what they call the identity and the self. And no matter how old you get, unless you've made a lot of new psychological theories and so forth, you're stuck with that one, and it seems very permanent and immediate and, and unchangeable because it's all you've got. When you were a baby, it was this few little lumps of cells that say, that's me, and you, don't, you never grow up. <laughs> so you don't need anything more other than what we have in our craniums to explain consciousness. Well, I'd hate to... Uh, to feel that there's some other world and I mean I worked very hard to become a good scientist mm -hmm. and I studied mathematics for many years and finally proved some theorems no one else did and I felt this was a, a great thing it was wonderful and uh, it was hard work now if somebody comes along and says uh, there's a little oyster in the universe and you're the pearl <laughs> and some creator gave you this ability well that's very demeaning. I don't want to be dissed by saying my <laughs> virtues come from a soul. I worked hard, and our whole culture worked very hard to get its ideas. I didn't invent calculus. Archimedes made a big step, and then there were 2,000 years of nonsense, and uh, then along came Galileo and Newton, and finally he got calculus into and Leibniz into workable form. 
So the idea of the soul seems to me very demeaning. It's saying nothing we do has any consequences. <laughs> There's someone else just dropping these little gifts on us. Terrible idea. What would happen if you believed it? You wouldn't do anything. 